Okay, so we're recording. Um, so everybody could see this chart? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Let me basically put myself on the screen so I could see what I'm doing. Huh. So if I shut off screen share, what happens? Okay. All right, well, I can't see myself, but that's okay. As long as you can see. So you can see the chart? Yes. Yes. Okay, so let me just go, I'm gonna go through a lot of the stuff I did last week uh, and then expand it and I'm gonna sort of overview the whole uh, technique and then go into at least some demonstrations. I'm not gonna talk about details this week because the details of the frosting on the cake let me admit this person. So to me, the, the details of the frosting on the cake, so I'm not gonna go through that. Like I ta uh, talked about it last week, the rally technique came out of the Art Students League in New York City between 1940 and 1968. And a couple of the key artists that came out of that are famous uh, Southwest illustrators, James Baum and Clark Keelings. I talked about that last week. Now the whole trick to this technique the whole is more important than the parts. So I'm not detail oriented, oriented, but we'll talk about the detail probably next week. Uh, detail and anatomy are like frosting on the whole thing. Uh, the real key here is to get the action lines and the big shapes down. And that in involves you actually seeing what's there. And we'll, I'm gonna go through this again and again and again. So don't, don't be too concerned about it right now. I studied this guy, Cesar Borgia, in White Plains, New York for 12 years, uh, mostly drawing, some painting. And for reference, uh, if you want to find more about my painting techniques, which we're not going to talk about until the future, I said Helen, I, um, Helen Van Wyck on PBS is the most close, closely related to how I paint, because I use I paint in the whole, the whole painting at once, not uh, piece by piece. Uh, Anthony Ryder, I also think is a really good painter, but he paints piece by piece. It's not my technique. Now, the curious thing about Ryder is that he's also studying at a rally student, and the rally student was Ted Seth, Seth Jacobs, who actually gave Ryder the tech drawing technique that he uses, which again is essentially a physical measurement based technique. Uh, it, that's not what I do, and it's not. Not, it's not really the rally technique, which I kind I find kind of interesting, given that Ted Seth Jacobs, who was a rally student, was one of the rally's favorite students, taught taught uh, something teaches something entirely different. Um, for the drawing videos, those from YouTube, YouTube for some reason their framing and their video quality is is much worse than what I have on YouTube on my YouTube sites. And that's where those videos actually originally came from in 2012. Udemy taught, worked on me for about a month to basically put the videos on their site. This is when they were just emerging and they weren't a big, big company. And I mean, I've taken grief ever since because those videos were never, at least the free ones were never meant for uh, public viewing. They're just meant for the students. I had a student shoot them who uh, didn't really do a good job, but you know, that's the reason they're free. And even the paid ones, I shot myself with a camera on a tripod, so they're stable, but they're not, they're not uh, professional quality, and that's why they're so cheap. So, okay, uh, the procedure, the way I work this is I start with lines of action, large lines, then small, and then on these lines of action, I put large forms and then small forms. And then I use something that it's not in the Riley technique, I actually use negative space to position small forms. And I'm gonna show you demonstrations of this explicitly. I just wanna go through this now so you get an overview of where, where we're going with this and what, you know, what I, what I, how I do it. Um, I use value, uh, light to dark. I typically try to do a complete drawing in under 45 minutes. So I only use four to six values and I'll talk about value in a minute. You could put, if you go longer, you could put as many values as you want. You could bring 
once you get the forms down and the action and some of the detail in anatomy, you could put, you know, you could put as much detail and value as you want. You can, you can go for hours if you want. I'm going to talk about edges in line with foreshortening, uh, how to basically have things advance or recede with edges. Uh, bone, how you basically indicate bone is versus flesh with edges. And then very end, probably next week, we'll talk about details. I'll give you tricks for eyes, nose, face, mouth, ears, uh, hands and feet. Now, all the tricks I'm going to show you is, is that if your eye level, you're at basically the same eye level as the person you're looking at. So it's so straight forward, either from the side or from the back, front, three quarters. But once you go up or you, know, you start looking down at the person or up at the person, everything changes because of the foreshortening. That's why it's really important that you actually see the abstract shapes to start with. Okay. All right, I talked about this last week, right brain versus left brain. Don't get discouraged if you don't pick this up right away. It's all about you actually being able to see the shapes and the action lines which involve the motion. And that takes a little while. If, you, if you've been using the left side of your brain most of your life, like most of us, it takes a little while for you to start using the right side. Um, now the shapes I use, I use circles and spheres. I use triangles sometimes, not very often. I use cylinders and I use ellipses and ellipsoid, ellipsoidals. I don't use any squares or rectangles. And if you basically uh, got a Bridgman book, which is who Riley studied under, you notice that Bridgman uses a lot of blocks and squares and rectangles. I didn't use any of those because the minute I start using a square, I have to stop my pencil. And you'll see when I do this, my lines are continuous. I never take my hand off the paper. I never erase. Uh, that's again, part of this technique. And that's why you can actually capture things really quickly because I'm not doing piecemeal lines. Like a lot of drawing techniques, you do piecemeal lines. I don't do that. So the line is continuous. I keep the pencil on the paper. Uh, I don't do any sketchy motions. Um, I draw through forms, overlap to make things come forward or recede. I'll also talk about drapery, how to put drapery on the figure. And that involves following the form and the laws of gravity. But we'll talk about that. We'll get into it today at the very end. OK, uh, I talked about this last week, Ferragasso's book. And I said, you know, if you go on Amazon, it's like 125 to 200, depending on whether you want to get a uh, a used or a new one, or I don't know where they're getting new ones because things out of print. Um, but I found on this website, you can actually get this book for 25 to 20, uh, 22 to 25 dollars. It's out of England and it's got to be a knockoff. I mean, I'm assuming they went to some country where the printing costs are nothing. And I don't know how they're, how they're getting around the copyright, but it's, it's basically between 20 and 20, 22 and 25 dollars. It was 25, I think they dropped it to 22 this week. So uh, so if you're interested, it, this is really a good reference book. It's really too complicated for beginners. He really does go through the Riley technique in detail. I mean, all the nuts and bolts. Uh, I've actually simplified it to just sort of essential uh, parts of it. And, and that's what I use to make it easier for people to pick up and also to make it faster for you to draw. But I'll, I'll, you'll see that as I go through demonstrations. Now, the other book is the one that myself, my wife wrote 10 years ago, and there's two versions of it. The original version, I, you probably could find it online someplace, but I, I don't know how. The other version is on Lulu, and you can get an ebook download for 10 bucks and a hard copy for 25. I've seen it on Amazon UK for seven bucks. I don't know how they're doing this. It again, it has to be some kind of knockoff. And again, it would be a copyright infringement because I certainly didn't authorize it. Um, the materials you need, I'm going to use newsprint today. But as I get in and I do really complete drawings in the 40 to 45 minutes, maybe in a couple of weeks, if you want me to, I use 500 series charcoal, Strathmore charcoal paper, mixed tones. So I use a mixed tone paper so that I get a, a middle value automatically and I don't have to work, worry about that. So I don't use white paper. Um, now this is the key. I use Wolf Carbon Pencils. Now Wolf Carbon Pencils uh, have a history going back about 125, 150 years. They were originally made in England 
The factory stopped making them in the early 90s. You couldn't buy them. Uh, these were always used at the Art Students League by everyone that taught there. The key is that they're a combination of uh, charcoal and graphite. So they go on really smooth. So there's no rough bits. You can really move the pencil fast. It's like silk. Now, you can get 1B, 2B, 4B, and 6B in the Wolfs. I used 2B to start and 4B to finish. Uh, th this is. Uh, this will be increasing softness, okay? Now, the, the deal with the Wolf pencils, you can now buy them in any art supply store, for probably for about 150 to two bucks a piece. In 1990, the company in England went out of business and people were so desperate, they were paying like 20 to $25 per pencil online for these things. Uh, luckily, in the early 90s, 93 or 94, a company in Rochester, New York took over the wolf process, the manufacturing process, and, and basically resurrected wolf pencils again. So now you can find them anyplace, and they're relatively inexpensive. Uh, needed eraser. I use it, I, don't, I never use an eraser when I draw. I basically only use the eraser for is at the very end when I clean up because I drag my hand across the paper all the time because I'm basically moving like this all the time. So I, I use the needed eraser to clean up. I try not to basically erase. I just Draw lines, okay. I I start light and then I just overdraw them. And by the way, the one thing about this manual that myself and my wife wrote, uh, she also studied under Caesar Borgia for about six years, and she's also a very good uh, draftsman and, and artist. But her our, her deal is fiber art now compared to me, which is more or less painting and drawing. There's three demos in that book that I basically go through step by step, and I'm going to at least do one of them here, maybe two later on. But that's the one part that you're not going to find in the Ferragasso book. He's not going to walk you through a demo step by step by step in terms of how he builds the drawing up. Um, now, I also, when I go to complete drawings, I said I use tone paper, Strathmore 500 series. Uh, uh, everything is done with uh, the pencils except for the highlights that I use. I typically use white pastel chalk. You can use uh, white uh, white. Uh, carbon or white charcoal, if you like. I sometimes use it. It's not as effective as the pastel chalk. So, again, that's. Now, I mo know most of you know this, but I'll go over it anyway. The value is the last thing I start putting on the drawing before I put the detail in, and I'll, and I'll show, go through that shortly. But it typically it's the standard value chart from zero to 10, 10 being the lightest, zero being the darkest. And Everything, I use what's known as Rembrandt lighting, which for me is lighting from the above from the left because I'm right-handed. If you're left-handed, you probably want to go lighting from the right from above. Uh, seeing that most people are left-handed, most drawing groups I've been in, if they do it correctly, they'll always basically have the lighting above and from the left on the model. And the reason for that is that you basically get really a, a good pattern of light and shade, which gives you, uh, you gives you it gives you the possibility of doing three dimensionality on a two dimensional surface. You could do backlighting or two two light two you can have two light sources or you know multiple light sources. But the minute you do that, you're going to flatten the image. You're basically not going to get a, a three dimensional image on a, on a two dimensional surface. So this is pretty standard in all art schools or drawing groups I've ever been in. Um, Typically, it's the standard deal. As you move from the light into the shadow, you, you go through something called the turning edge or the coarse shadow or the terminator. And it was also called, believe it or not, the bed bug line. And this comes from about 150 years ago. The French art students uh, in the 19th century were living in hovels because they were poor. And the deal was when they come in and flip the lights on, Bed bugs would run towards the, the shadow, the, the, the line where the shadow would line start relative to the light area. So that's why you, you'll see it sometimes called the bed bug line, which I find sort of curious. Okay, so it's a standard deal. I basically have a highlight, then I have some midtones in the light. I got the core, the turning edge, then I have the darks. And as I go towards the bottom, I basically get reflected light. So it gets a little bit lighter because I'm getting reflected light off surfaces. Then the darkest dark in any drawing is essentially cast shadow. And it starts very dark where there's no light right under this ball. And then it gets a little bit lighter as you move out. And there's also edge work here. The edge is very hard where you start to cast shadow and get softer as you move out. 
And again, I'm gonna go over this again and again and again. And this actually comes in handy for the human form, particularly in, in terms of getting the three dimensionality and showing forms to project or receive. Uh, and again, you know, you gotta, you gotta see this as I, as I do some demonstrations. I just want to give you, give you an overall feel for where all this is going. All right, this is about line and edge. Again, this is important too. And the line, uh, basically, I, you see, see me talk about hard edges and soft edges. Hard edges will always make the form come forward. Soft edges will always make it recede. Uh, I'm going to use a word occasionally. You're going to hear me hear it, use the word sev, S-E-V. And that involves shape edge and value. That's the way you get three dimensionality on a two dimensional surface, okay? So edges are really important. And again, I can vary the edge with, even though I'm doing continuous motion with, with uh, my drawing tool, I can vary that edge by the way I rotate the pencil and the way I shape the pencil uh, uh, that I'm drawing with. Now I'm gonna go that, through that shape in a second. The shape is basically a triangle. One surface is flat, I, 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 I make the triangle with sandpaper, this stuff here, right? Okay, so I sand it down so I get one flat surface, and then I could go from that flat surface, which gives me a broad, soft line, to I rotate it, and then I basically have the point, which will give me a really hard, fine, uh, fine edge. And you'll see me do that, and that's how I do it without taking my hand off the paper. Okay, so the flat edge is soft, the point is hard. Um, I use edges for anatomy. Uh, soft is flesh, hard is bone. Uh, shoulder bone, uh, shoulders, knees, hip bone, clavicle, those are all hard. Buttocks, breast, stomach, soft, okay? That's another way you're creating, working on the anatomy and creating form and having the, again, the, the drawing actually come forward as a three-dimensional object as, as opposed to the two-dimensional surface you're working on. Also, value changes can give you a hard edge. So if I go from, again, from the darkest dark to the lightest light, particularly in the cast shadow area, I'm gonna get a hard edge. I can soften that edge with value by basically, again, uh, going to darker and darker values. So I can go, I can make something go from very hard edge to uh, essentially a lost edge or soft edge by, by value too. And that's, again, just, you know, changing the amount of charcoal you're putting down on the paper or, or carbon in, in the case of the pencils I use. All right, I vary edges. Mo I use mostly soft edges with a few hard edges. I never outline the face or figure with a hard edge. And I've seen that people do that over and over again. I mean, you don't want to do it. It looks like someone took something and they pasted it on the paper, okay? And that's a, a begin again, problem that beginners have because they picked it up someplace where they think if they have all the hard edges, the object comes forward. Well, it does come forward, but it looks like you pasted the thing on paper. All right. Um, so I never outline the face of figure with hard edges. I avoid, I avoid symmetrical placement of edges. That is, I'll put edges in that shouldn't even be there just to move your eye around the drawing and give some variety. So, and it'll be a zigzag pattern. I'll never have edges that are opposite one another, perfectly opposite one another all the way down the drawing. You, know, you don't wanna do that because again, your eye basically is gonna fill in a lot of what I do into believing you I'm doing a lot more than I'm actually really doing on the drawing. And that's another trick or key to this whole technique. I wanna fool you into believing that you're seeing something that you're not because your brain is gonna interpret it the way I want you to interpret it. Namely, I'm gonna put all the detail, a lot of the values, the hardest edges, biggest value changes in the focal area, which is usually the face and upper body on the drawing. In a painting, it's the same deal. I, I'm gonna basically put a lot of the detail in and make you look at the focal point and your brain is gonna fill in everything around it thinking I did all this work, which I really didn't do. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk about perspective and foreshortening. Some of the, the demonstrations I'm gonna do, our, you know, our ideal case where I'm looking right at the person. So there's no, almost no foreshortening. The minute I start moving around, moving up and down to the side, the person starts turning, you're going to get foreshortening. And that's foreshortening is basically uh, an outgrowth of perspective. So there's three types of perspective, one, two, and three point perspective. Mostly what we're talking about with drawing is two point. 
Uh, one point would just be a train track where you look straight down it. Three point would be if you're standing at the base of a building looking up or at the top of the building looking down, then you not only have the two perspectives in the plane of the building, but also the, 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 in the perspective and the height of the building. Most of what we're doing in foreshortening involves two point, not three point. Bigger drawing, shallow depth of field, and I keep saying three dimensional on two dimensional surfaces, it's an outgrowth of perspective. And I probably will never mention perspective again, but you're gonna hear me talk about foreshortening in all the time. Again, with foreshortening, again, the word sev. So I get foreshortening by using shape, edge, and value. So big shapes come forward, small shapes recede. Hard edges come forward, soft edges recede. Light values come forward, dark edges recede. The cast shadow, which uh, I don't know if you know about what Trump Loy is, again, it's something that goes back three, 400 years. The cast shadow could actually make an object almost lift off the paper, okay? It makes the shape advance, extremely advanced, okay? And then I sort of drew a couple of examples down here. The whole key, again, is not only the lines of action, but the abstract shapes. You really have to see the abstract shape. So in a sense, I'm teaching you abstract art. Okay, so again, here's value. I'm showing you this ball coming forward because I got a dark ball on the back of it. Shape, small ball, a uh, small ball to a large ball. So that as, it's, as the ball goes back, the shape gets smaller, it recedes, and under, it overlaps each one. Edge, again, the hard edge comes forward, the soft edge is receding, and again, the cast shadow should lift the whole object off the paper. All right, so I'm just gonna run through it down. Uh, sort of a quick demo, and then I'm actually gonna do some demos for you. But again, let me go through this pretty carefully. So I have a model and she's sitting down and I start out with the line of action. So here's the big line of action. It essentially more or less follows her spine and I'm not paying too much detail to the arms and legs here. So then the next thing I do is I put on some of the big shapes, the big abstract shapes. I always start with the head because this allows me to visually measure the rest of the shape. So I have a uh, sort of an oval for the head. And then I put in a sort of a, again, an oval for the chest. And the size of this is based on the chest, uh, the rib cage, basically. But I'm, I'm gearing the size, making it larger and a little bit different shape than respect to the head. If you notice, it's almost the shape of a rib cage. And then the pelvis, again, from the side is actually just, uh, again, uh, a ellipsoid shape. And again, I'm, I'm making that shape relative to actually what the pelvis would actually look like. And it could be a little bit bigger, you know, but it's, it's not, it's not gonna be, the, the head is never gonna be bigger than the chest, uh, the, object, the shape that I put down for the chest or for the pelvis. Okay, then I, I'm gonna put in small lines of action. The small lines in this case, this is, a standard pose where the model shoulder is going in one direction, her hips are going in another direction. I think it's called counterpasta. Counterpasto? Pasta? Pasto, I guess. Again, it goes back hundreds of years. And this small action is for the shoulders. And this large action goes through the hip bones, the hip pointers, okay? And then I put a few lines on. It, I'm drawing a stick figure. So I'm drawing a line for the one leg. That, uh, this would be the right leg, and this is the left leg. And I think I have a line in there for that arm coming down. Okay, so now I got the large action, the large action, the small action. I've got some uh, all the big shapes in, and I put a few lines in for the large uh, for the uh, the legs and arms. All right, so now for step two, I basically go back. I'm working the whole thing. I refine the whole thing. I start at the top, work down. So I start putting in some a little more uh, detail for the face. I position the eye socket. This again is a trick. The eye socket's usually at about half the distance down the face. And that essentially I could actually form the face a little better by putting an oval in and then essentially another sort of cone, cone shaped uh, form for the, uh, for the chin. I put a few of the forms in for the nose and mouth. And I'm going to, again, I don't want to go into the detail. It's not important. <clears throat> what is important right now are the, the big and small shapes, the action lines. And working the entire drawing from working the entire drawing up in each sequence that you go through in, in terms of making it more and more uh, accurate and more and more uh, believable. Okay, so and this it was a female model, so I put the breasts in as basically as one unit and I divided them up 
I put in a, a sort of a shape for the arm here. I haven't even put the hand in yet. I put in some shapes in here for the legs and for the calves. I put in some shapes, small shapes for the feet. Again, this again I mentioned negative space. I'm actually for refining the legs. I'm actually using what's shaded here as a negative space. I'm using that to give me a correct positioning of the two legs with respect to each other. You're not going to find this in the rally technique. Okay, this is something that I added in. Again, it's a, a trick that I'm using to help you visually position things without measuring. I mean, I could have measured the distance. You know essentially use a side size type technique where I'd actually sitting here and with the model and I'm actually measuring it and then I put it down on the paper. But this is much quicker and it just is just as effective. So, all right, so then the next thing I'm doing, I start putting in some values. I have actually just put in, I haven't put all four to six values that I would use in a complete drawing in 45 minutes. I'm just putting in, um, Okay, no one else came into the site. Okay, I'm just putting in uh, dark and light values. And again, I'm using Rembrandt, Rembrandt lighting. So the light is coming uh, from the left and from above. Model's hair is dark. I have uh, shadows. Uh, essentially, I'm, this essentially is the uh, demarcation between light and dark, and I'm just putting that in. And then I put a few hard edges in. You notice I put a hard edge in for the shoulder, for the kneecap. I put a hard edge all along this leg to make it come forward more than this one. Uh, I again have some dark values. I've tried to put a few of the reflected lights in here, making it a little lighter as I go towards the back of the, uh, the dark shadow. But again, this is again just a rough version. Uh, I mean, I need about three more steps to complete, go through three more steps where I completely refine it to actually put in all the values, work on the anatomy and the details. Okay, but that. Right now, that's not important, okay? And if I was doing this in a drawing group, this would be the first 25 minutes. So one, two, and three would be the first 25 minutes. I would use a Wolf 2B pencil, which is the harder pencil, so I'd get lighter lines. The second 20 minutes, I'd use a Wolf 4B. I would rework everything. I'd start putting in the details. I'd correct things. I'd put in more values. And again, if you go beyond 45 minutes or 30 minutes, you can put in as many values as you want as you refine this. Uh, again, I would be using tone paper for the middle value, so I wouldn't have to do that. I would put in more hard and uh, soft edges, uh, uh, bone hard uh, to make things advance, soft flesh, soft to make things recede. I'd start putting in small details. And I, the final thing I would actually do is put the highlight in which would probably be on her upper chest and her, uh, given the directional light a little bit on her chin, her forehead, upper chest, maybe on her kneecaps. Uh, and that would be with the white pastel chalk, but that's the last thing I would do. And then I would actually clean it up because I drag my hand all the time. I'm basically dragging my hand like this. I clean the, all the, uh, the essentially where I drag my hand with the kneaded eraser, but I never use this thing except at the very end. But that, you don't have to do that. I mean, that's just the way that I work. And I just basically would draw over, you could actually say, I just complete, keep drawing over the lines until I get what I wanted. Because I started with light lines and then I moved to darker lines as I refined it. All right, now let me discuss a little bit on, uh, this is really rough details. I'm not giving you the real nitty gritty yet. Um, but this, this is just the rough details of different positions of the head. The back is the easiest one, okay? Uh, essentially, you only have to, it's an elliptical shape. You got the ears and then you have the neck merging with the, essentially the, uh, uh, when I draw the, a figure for the back, you're gonna see I use a triangle to basically uh, initially put in the shape for the back. If I'm looking at the head from the side, I already told you that the key to get the, I would first draw, refine the, the oval into a more of a circle, then I put the chin in with another, sort of oval. Uh, the distance for the eye socket's about halfway down. So that's the eye socket right there. It's about halfway down. And then I would divide the, the, the head into thirds. I'm going to use this law of thirds a lot. So the idea is the hairline, hopefully the person has a hairline, you got the hairline to the brow ridge is a third, from the brow ridge to the bottom of the nose is a third, from the bottom of the nose to the bottom of the chin is a third. The ear placement is basically 
Uh, back, it's almost, uh, you can see I drew, drew a square here. It's the distance from the eye socket to the back of the ear, basically to the, the bottom of the chin, you, you get a, a square. So that would help you position the back of the ear. The ear is typically between the brow ridge and a little bit below the nose on most people. But it, again, that ear varies all over the place. Uh, and some things I'm going to say about the mouth position, uh, typically the center of the mouth would be a third down from the bottom of the nose, uh, but that varies all over the place too. Um, but again, these are ideal cases. And, and again, like I said, there's no foreshortening here. This is just strictly measurement for ideal cases. This all changes the minute this person he tilts his head, everything changes. So that's why you have to see the shapes. You have to be able to see the abstract shapes. Okay. So front, if it's a front view, it's the same game. The eyes are halfway down. I divided this into thirds, okay? And I put the center line from the mouth down, a third from the bottom of the nose. Three quarters, what I do for three quarters, I actually draw a, a line dividing the left side of the face from the right side. Here I have to deal with foreshortening. Everything on the left side is foreshortened in the eye, the lip. So all the Features on the left side of the face are foreshortened relative to the right side. And again, I've shown you what I did here. I divided the face down. Again, here's the three where I've divided into thirds. Uh, and again, I'm not, this is just very, very rough. I'm not going through any of the really nitty gritty of the details. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm talking about some of the small shape, but not any detail. And these are idealized cases. Hands back few. It turns out, again, law of thirds. <clears throat> if you have a hand in, again, perfect back, back view, no foreshortening, from the first knuckle, from the first knuckle to the second one, is that would basically each time you go through a knuckle, and there's three of them, one, two, three, you reduce it by a third. So the first shape, this length, distance would be about, if this is one, this would be two thirds of that, and this would be four ninths of that. So each time you you're getting a third smaller each time you go through a joint. Um, the thumb, it's the same deal. Uh, it basically, you start at the base of the thumb, and again, every time you go through a joint, it would basically be re reduced by a third. But I'll, I'll, when I talk about details in, in, in the future, I'll go through this again and again and again. If you look at the hand from the front, it's, it's different. Once you get the, the shape of the thumb in and for the palm, the, the fingers all look like they're equally spaced. The joints all look like they're equally spaced from the front. But again, it's only for the ideal case, no foreshortening. From the side, you, got, you start with a triangle, you put your thumb in, and then basically, uh, I guess your index finger, and then you may be able to see a few of the other fingers. But again, it's an ideal case. All right, for the feet, I actually start with a half an ellipse, and then I can out later on, I fill in with the toes and the big toe. This is from the front. Now, another thing I wanted to point out here is something that a lot of beginners always mistake they always make. They make sausage calves. The calf, the bones in the calves, you don't get sausage legs. The shape of the calf is higher on the outside than it is on the inside, okay? That's what this line is indicating. And the ankles go in the opposite direction. So the inside ankle would be higher than the outside ankle. Uh, this is a mistake I see all the time with beginners. If I looked at the foot from the side, it's a tri triangular shape, and then I just fill in the, the pattern. So you notice I'm basically putting down abstract shapes that I'm trying to make the correct size before I put any detail in at all. Okay, if I'm looking at the foot from the back, again, the calves, remember, if this is the outside, it's higher than the inside. And again, for the ankle, it's the opposite. So I just remember this. If you basically remember the, the calf on the outside is higher than on the inside, you just remember the calf's going, uh, the ankle's going the opposite direction. So at the back of the foot, I'm using a triangle, but then I can actually fill it in. And again, the, the, the abstract shape that I'm using here is a triangle. So I, I use mostly circles, ellipses, and sometimes triangles. I don't use any squares like Bridgman did. Okay, we're not going to get into this today, but again, the details that I'll talk about in the future, I'll, I'll talk about now you put the eyes in the nose, the mouth, the ears. So this is the hierarchy. The eyes are always the most important to me, okay? So that would be the first deal, detail I put in, then the mouth, then the nose. And the last thing I put in is, is the ears. They're the least important.
important usually in drawings, except if you're looking at someone from the side. And again, if you go to uh, the Riley book uh, by Ferragasso, you see a drawing where they have, they go through an extensive amount of, of, of uh, geometrical plane uh, determination of the face, with all kinds of lines. I mean, it drives beginners crazy. Uh, the easiest way to look at it, there's certain planes, if the light again, Rembrandt lighting coming from the left uh, above, the planes you have to worry about, you got the forehead plane, you got some side planes that are less important. You got the facial plane, uh, and then you got side planes for the cheeks. The eyes are sockets, so they'd be shaded in initially. Then you'd have the nose, triangular shape, but again, for this lighting condition, you get a cast shadow from the nose <coughs> on the, uh, I guess this is the left side of the drawing, and I guess it might be your right side. And again, the lips, third way down, there's the center line for the lips, you get a cast shadow here. Again, slight cast shadow under, as you go into the chin, there's another plane down here for the chin. The mouth cylinder is a, uh, basically a cylinder that actually comes forward, it's like a dog's snoot. It's just not as pronounced in humans. And then you have a couple side planes and I put the ears in. So those, again, those are the most important things you have to worry about initially is the placement, again, of the, of the features. The eyes are halfway down, then the hairline, if, if you can get a hairline, you go a third of the way down to the brow ridge, then a third of the way down to the bottom of the nose, a third, third of the way down to the bottom of the chin, a third of the way down to the center line for the mouth. Uh, the eyes are always separated by about an eye distance. Uh, and typically the outside edge of the eye typically would line up with the edge of the mouth. But this is not true in everybody, but it, this is sort of the, the ideal case. And again, you have to worry about these planes in terms of the, of, of the value pattern you're gonna get. Of course, everything away from the light that's on a plane that's receding from the light is gonna be shaded, okay? And the cast shadows really help make the features come forward, okay? So they're really key for this lighting condition. Like I said, if I have backlighting, I lose all this. If I have two, two lights coming from each side, I lose all this. So I automatically flatten the image if I'm using multiple light sources. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go through another demo. Again, I did the figure. Now I'm just gonna talk about if I was just gonna do a portrait. Again, it's the same game. I start out with an oval shape and there, this is my, I, I don't, my line of action really, I'm just, it's really this dividing line for the face because I'm doing a three quarters profile. The eyes are halfway down again. And then I have my, my law of thirds. I divide this into thirds a third for the hairline, a third for the brow ridge, a third for the bottom of the nose, and then the chin, okay? And then the neck, the bottom, the front of the neck is always shorter than the back of the neck because of the overlap of the rib cage. All right, so I get that in. So then the next step, the next go around, I start, I'll put the hair in a little more detail. I put in dark so sockets for the eyes and rough, very rough shapes for the iris, for the uh, eyeball, a little bit of shape for the uh, brow, I put in the nose as a shape. I'm putting in, I'm indicating the planes for the cheeks and for the forehead. The mouth, third of the way down, I put in the top lip, bottom lip. Again, the chin. Again, I have foreshortening, so this shape has to be smaller than this shape. This side of the mouth has to be smaller than this side. Okay? So then the third thing I do, <clears throat> I basically go to the value pattern. Again, it's Rembrandt lighting from the left and from above. I start putting in more detail for the eyes. I put in the cast shadows and some of the lighting. Again, here's the turning edges. I'm moving away from the light. Again, I'm, I should have some reflective light in here where it gets lighter. Again, there's a cast shadow under the chin that I'm indicating. All right, so again, I'm starting to refine. I got some hard edges. I got a hard edge for the forehead, hard edge on the cheek. Uh, typically, I don't put hard edges on the nose, even though there might be a very slight hard edge there because you don't want the nose to be prominent or, or stick out. And usually the value pattern, because this is in the light, the value pattern automatically makes the nose, uh, the demarcation of the nose a, a lot softer than when, uh, say, you go into the cast shadow area where you got a cast shadow under the chin or a cast shadow from the nose. That cast shadow makes the nose actually come forward. So you don't have to make this edge real hard. And then the hair, the edges are soft. So again, 25 minutes, I go through one, two, and three, using a Wolf 2B pencil. The second 20 minutes, I use a Wolf 4B. Uh, it's the same as a figure, I use palm paper. 
Again, uh, last thing I do are the highlights with white, white pastel chalk, okay? All right, now I'm just gonna mention drapery again, and we'll talk about this more in, in the future. All right, again, you'll find this in the Ferragasso book and also in, in our drawing manual. It's the same game with drapery. The minute I start putting drapery on the figure, the drapery has to follow the forms of the figure. That's number one. You also have to obey the laws of gravity. So if I have drapery on the arm, gravity's gonna pull the drapery down. So it has to follow the form on the top part of the arm and then fall down where it's basically uh, following gravity. So I have those two rules. I gotta follow gravity and I gotta follow the form. Now the value patterns, that's what gives drapery its punch. Most drapery has hard edges, okay? Some has soft, but usually if you put, start putting drapery on the figure, you're gonna have a lot of hard edges uh, because it's usually the drapery is crisp. The value patterns are exactly the same that I use on the figure and on the head. I've used four to six values if it's a 45 or 30 minute pose. Tone paper, and again, I'm showing you here, I have, this is a fold, the highlights on the top of the fold, and then as I go away on this side, I'm going into the mid-tones and the light, and the mid-tones and the light on the other side of the fold, and then I go into the turning edge, into the darks. I got some reflected light here. And then I get a cast shadow because the fold, again, it's, it's a fold. You want the fold to come out. So again, I'm using a four, four to six different values that I use. I have a cast shadow here, the highlight. I have the reflected light. I have the core shadow. And then I have the mid-tones and the light, okay? Now, one thing, again, I see all the time people make mistakes. They make the reflected light shadow as light or even lighter than the mid-tones and the light as it, it turns into the, the core shadow or the turning edge. That's wrong. Anything in the shadow can never be as light as anything in the light, even with reflected light. It can never happen, okay? Okay, that's a mistake I see all the time. All right, all right. And then finally, I'm afraid those of you that are worried about being not good at this, I'm gonna give you a cheat, a way to cheat which is totally legitimate when you're learning. It's called the grid technique, okay? So if you're worried about not getting your, your shapes correct, um, you know, you're looking at your shapes and you know, you think you're seeing something, but it's actually wrong. It's too big or too small. Again, you gotta see the abstract shapes and you gotta see the action lines, okay? And to help you, you can use a grid technique. It's been used for centuries. I use it on large complicated painting pieces because I used to not use it in the past. And what would happen is I have to go, you know, I basically draw the thing in with um, some burnt sienna and then I have to wipe it out because I never got get the positioning right the first time. I, you know, I couldn't, I could not get the positioning of the figure or whatever I was doing on the canvas correct the first time, particularly on a really large piece. So for good for large complicated pieces, particularly for me for positioning, I'll use a grid. And the deal with the grid is you break, it breaks a large piece into smaller parts so that you can actually, suppose I have a photograph and I basically grid this photograph into one inch square. So there's five one inch squares here and six one inch squares here. And I wanna scale it up to a drawing that's, that's bigger. And I, this drawing, I just wanna go up to maybe a drawing that's the same size Paper has the same dimensions, and we'll talk about that in a second. But I want to scale it up to one and a half inch. So now my squares are one and a half inch. I still have five of them here and six here. And I can actually copy what I have on my photograph or, 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 or my printout. I can actually copy. It's almost like the measurement technique, uh, where I'm actually looking at this and I'm putting it down here, looking at this and I'm putting it down here. And I'm saying, you know, same thing for each one. Totally, totally valid technique to use. I mean, like I said, I use it in painting, position the uh, position things. You can use it in drawing to try to, as you start learning, to get your shapes correct, your shapes and your action lines correct. Um, now, if I wanted to really scale it up, I'm giving you an example down here where I go take something that's 11 by seven inches, okay? And I wanna scale it up to 50 by 32 inches. So 11 by seven, the ratio is 1.56. So to scale it up, I need a canvas or piece of paper that matches this ratio that has exactly the same uh, value of the height to width ratio. So this would have to be 50 by 32, which gives me the same ratio of 1.56.
Now the size of the square, if I'm going from a one inch square here on the 11 by seven, which would say to be this. So I take 11 by one inch to 50 by X, okay? And X turns out to be 4.5 inches. So the squares on, that I have to do on this piece here where I scale on, scaling it up would have to be 4.5 inches per square. And you can do this with any size you want, okay? And again, it's a trick. It's a basic trick to give you a break if you think you're getting your shapes wrong or you're not getting your lines right. Uh, and again, you'll move away from this as you get better. Okay, so that's the first part of this. Now I'm gonna actually go into some demonstrations after I answer a few questions. And by the way, I extended my time period to run this from 30 minutes to indefinite period of time. So I basically upgraded to Zoom Pro. I broke down and paid for it. So uh, I knew I couldn't contain myself for 30 minutes because I love the lab. So anyway. All right. So let me get this up here. All right. Now, does anyone have any questions before I do anything else? Someone must have a question. No one has a question? Really? All right. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do something actually from real life. Not from real life, from actually a drawing. But I'm not going to complete it. I'm, not, I'm just going to give you the rough thing. Sorry, uh, I, I do have a question. Sure. I was just looking. Hold on. Um, so you've covered a lot of material here uh, very quickly. Uh, I, I assume this is like an overview and that we're going to... You're going to yeah. see this again and again and again. And it's okay. going to be online. So I gave you the whole overview so you know where all this is going. I only have 10 tricks that I use. You saw them all. The real trick here is to see the action lines in the large shapes. Get the gesture down as fast as you can and get it down accurately. That's the real key to this whole technique. If you can do that, you can do people in motion. You could, I could do, do my dog right now. I could do an animal when she's jumping or moving. The whole question is I can get something down in 15 to 30 seconds in terms of action lines. And I'll do that right here. You could time me. It probably it'll be 10 seconds. I'll get something down in terms of action lines in the large shapes and the sm and the small, large and small action, the large, uh, the large shapes and some of the indication of the legs and arms. So it looks just like a stick figure. The minute I get that down, the person can go away. If I have a photograph of them, or even if I, I could do it from, a, from my imagination if I want, I could fill in all the details two hours, three hours, two days later, okay? But that, that involves a little knowledge of the detail and anatomy. But the I, idea is that once I get the gesture and the action down and the big shapes, if they're correct, I could fill it in. I don't need to even look at the, the, the person. I mean, to get really an accurate drawing, I want to look at the person because that's how I basically can get the details and personalize the image. I need to look at the person to get the anatomy down. Now, I don't dwell on anatomy. Anatomy is good, but you don't need to know that much, much anatomy because what happens is most people aren't ripped, okay? Um, you know, I've drawn bodybuilders and, you know, you can basically draw every muscle group and, it, you know, in the light, you're going to get every value pattern. You know, you, get, you go through every value pattern for each muscle group. And there's, there's artists that do that, and they're, you know, incredibly effective. Most, most people don't, aren't, basically don't have 5% body fat. So you're not going to see all these muscles. You know, most of this is covered by layers of fat and skin. So you really, you only really need to know a few things about anatomy uh, for anything. And you could, again, you could do any animal. Once you get the shapes down or the action down for the animal, you can go online and get a picture of the animal, fill in the, uh, the anatomy and the, uh, the details. So, you know, you can get this stuff online and then fill it in a new drawing, but it doesn't have to be the same um, uh, position. The animal could be in any position, just as long as you've got some information on what the animal looks like. Now, I'm not a pro on, on animals. I mean, I've worked on humans for, you know, I guess 30 years now, but to deal with humans, I could do this from, my, from imagination, from my mind, you know, like instantaneously, because I've done it over and over again 30 years, three hours every week from live models, except for the past you know, couple of months because of the pandemic. So I'm a, I know human to human anatomy backwards, forwards, and upside down. Now for animals, I did a lot of animal portraits last year where I worked from photographs. And if I needed more information, I'd go online and get the information online if I didn't have the animal posing for me, which is not gonna happen. 
But the fact that I could get the general shapes down, uh, you know, I could show you right now for a dog. I mean, for instance, suppose dog is, is sideways. And so there's a line of action. So I'd put a head like that. The shape would be something like this. Uh, I, I could actually put the legs in like that, front leg. Then I could draw a student, his ear. I could draw a tail. Uh, I have some idea what the front 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 would look like. The back haunch has basically looks something like that. Okay, it was a little, this is a little too big. Okay, so see, I but I mean, you saw how fast I could do this. Now I could I could refine this. I mean, I know sort of what this dog looks like, but I I know and refine this, you know, by getting something off online for the specific dog that I'm drawing here. And, you know, again, the fact that I got the action down and the big shapes and essentially just these lines for the, for the legs and tail, again, an oval for the body, and essentially an oval for the head and the snoot. I mean, I can now build this up to any level I want. So as you're refining this, you're going to er erase some of your construction no. line? No, I don't erase anything. You don't I'm erase anything? I'm going over it. Believe okay. me. I just <laughs> because I'm basically dragging my hand, I'm smudging the damn thing all the time anyway. I don't erase anything because if I erase, it slows me down and it basically just, it will distract from what I'm seeing because now I'm starting to, I'm starting to mess with it. Usually what you put down the first time, if it's not right, you just draw over it, okay? Like I said, in the second go around after the first 25 minutes when the model poses, I'll go back in and start correcting when she basically reassumes the position if anything is off. And basically, as you do this more and more, you're gonna get more and more accurate. The whole idea, again, is to use the right side of your brain and you're gonna start seeing the shapes and the action lines. And I also would suggest you draw with one eye because drawing with two eyes, you're gonna fool yourself because you're looking at the object from, from two points of view. I luckily, believe it or not, I have, I'm legally blind in one eye, so the fact that I always drew with one eye really helped me out. And so I still draw with one eye closed like this, just so that I'm basically not fooled into believing that I'm seeing something that actually isn't there. Um, so, but the idea that you're gonna get better in time, people don't think they can draw, it, it's not true. If you use this technique, you can draw a stick figure, you're gonna get better in time because the more you do this, the more you're gonna start using the right side of your brain. And like I mentioned last week, I've seen people in drawing groups that I've run, uh, essentially drawing classes, within three to four sessions, sometimes it takes six or seven, uh, they'll have a huge jump in improvement. And I initially never knew why because I'd ask them if they were practicing at home and they would tell me no. I'd ask them if they were listening carefully to what I said, and they'd say, well, sort of, which meant they didn't listen. So the point was, just by the three hours a week uh, of, of drawing from a live model and some instruction, in three to four weeks, they made a huge improvement in their drawing ability, basically in seeing what was actually in front of them, namely the, the abstract shapes. And that has to do with the right side of your brain, and I didn't believe it at first until I saw it again and again and again, year after year after year. And finally, I found a book by some artist who talked about the right side of your brain, left side of your brain, and how the right visual side will improve your drawing ability dramatically over time. And it's absolutely correct as far as I know, because I have no other explanation for it. So if you do this enough, you will improve. And it, for beginners, it's a drastic improvement. I had a guy in my classes that basically couldn't even draw stick figures initially. And now he's probably as good as I am. Uh, but that, again, it took practice. He did it for years. So he was drawing from a live model every week for, you know, four or five, six years. But it, you will improve. I mean, it, it has nothing to do with, well, I have, you have artistic ability and I don't. And that's, that's nonsense. It has nothing to do with this. Nothing to do with it. This, this is basically just a, an overview of a type of technique that allows you to draw quickly and get shapes down very fast. The rest has to do with you actually learning to visually see what's in front of you. And you have to see 
it's the abstract shapes that are, are important. That's why I haven't talked about any detail here yet. I was going to talk about detail next next week, particularly for the face and for the anatomy, but I don't want to do it this week. I just wanted to give you an overview of where this technique is going and how it works. So okay. anybody, any other questions? Uh, what, one more. Sure. So, so uh, the impact of uh, using a single eye, that reduces your three-dimensionality. Um, so I assume that if we're looking at the the models in the future on the on the computer screen, that's actually an advantage. Yeah, basically, what you want to do is when you draw, you want to. I haven't covered this yet, but when you start refining the drawing, you squint, so you just see the value pattern. You don't want any detail. You just want to see the lights and darks. So you squint to see the major value shape. So you put the major value pattern in first. So what you put in first would be the demarcation between the light and dark. So one area would be all light, then you'd have the turning edge, and one area would be sh shaded to, you know, uh, roughly a slight dark on the midtown uh, value side. And then you'd basically start refining it, but you squint to see. And also when you squint, you'd only see the hard, the hard edges would be more obvious than the soft edges. So the squinting actually helps you see the value pattern. It's the value pattern and the edges that are in the cast shadow that's going to give you the three dimensionality. The one eye thing is just going to give you an accurate description in a plane of what you're actually looking at. And it's not like a Picasso painting where you're looking at things from multiple sides and you actually see multiple dimensions of the same thing. Um, the value pattern and the edges and are going to, it's essentially the word SEB, shape, edge, value gives you the three dimensionality and, and the object coming off the surface. You can use two eyes, but I, I just, what I'm warning you is that you may actually see something that I don't see when I'm using one eye. So I may be more accurate than you than using, in terms of what I'm looking at, in terms of the abstract shapes. I mean, you could sort of, you, you could use two eyes as you basically start refining it more and more. Sure, you can use two eyes. But initially you might wanna just use one eye to see the, to make sure that the abstract shape you put down is actually close, as close to the final shape that you're going to refine it to. Um, again, you know, it, it varies from, uh, from person to person. Some people can do this with two eyes and do it accurately, but those are probably people that have been doing art and for all their lives. They're artists or prof art professors or professional artists. So they use the right side of their brain almost exclusively compared to the left side. The left side is going to trick. I mean, I didn't bring these. I have a two, two things that I show people, one of which some people get and the other one no one gets in terms of the, your, your left side of your brain telling you something that's not true. And one of us is a person walking up a track where you think that the, the person is actually uh, getting smaller as he's going up the track. And if I flip it over, you'll see that all, all the people that, I, that are on the track are the same size. It's because the shape of the track is basically going back in distance. Your left side of your brain is telling you that the person back is smaller than the person in front. Not true. I've got another one with a table, which you see from the front and then from the side. And you're going to swear that the two tables are not the same. And I'll take out a ruler and I'll measure the tables and I'll show you they're exactly the same. And that one, I don't even get. I mean, I, would, I still get fooled on that one. I can't get that one right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's the, the left side of your brain is going to, in, particularly when you're using two eyes and you're using the left side of your brain, is going to convince you. It's going to tell you that there's, there's things there that aren't your aren't really there. It's going, to, it's going to give you information from your memory and from your past learnings and fill in details that aren't there. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And so, again, like I said, once you start using the right side of your brain more, you're going to make a huge improvement if you're a beginner. If you're someone like me that's been doing this for like 30 years, my improvements are really, you know, I mean, it takes me years to see anything. It's usually I could draw faster. I mean, my, I increase my speed. Now, given I haven't drawn in a while, my speed's probably going to be pretty slow compared to what I could do when I was still drawing from a, from a live model every week for three hours. But everybody will improve and you will get better. And so the idea that you're not born with a gift is, to me, is nonsense. I mean, it's, it's all about using a, one, one, a certain technique. Uh, this technique's a little bit tougher than other techniques in that you have to visually measure rather than physically measuring. A lot of techniques you physically measure with a ruler or with a pen. It basically it's a variation of Sargent's sight size technique, which he used 150 years ago, 
where he put the model and the canvas in the same plane. He'd walk back from the center 20 or 30 feet. He'd measure something on the model with his pencil and then go down and put it on his canvas. Well, you know, it, he got incredibly accurate, beautiful paintings and drawings, but imagine the amount of work he had to do and the amount of walking he had to do to do this. So. And a lot of the, the LTAs in the United States and Europe teach a variation of the site size where the model doesn't move. I mean, the model's perfectly still. People draw an envelope and then they basically start measuring things and, you know, they put down, you know, each part by physical measurement. And again, it's very effective, but it takes a huge amount of time and you really are limited in terms of what you can, you can do with it. I mean, you have to do models that are re really perfectly still. And I could tell these people that have to use this technique because the, the drawings, except in a few cases, okay, always look really stiff. And you, I could tell they're using this type of technique. Now, the ones that are really good at it are the, the instructors, <laughs> okay? The people that study under them, usually I could tell, I could even tell which instructor they studied under in terms of how stiff the drawing is, okay? Painting's a little bit different. Painting, uh, it's harder to tell, but drawings I can always tell. Okay, any other questions? I'm gonna go through one thing and I'll, I've already talked for over an hour, so. Someone have, must have some more questions, so. Anybody wanna ask me anything else? This is all that obvious? Okay, no one wants to ask me anything, okay. Okay, the way I wanna proceed is I wanna go through a couple more weeks of this and then do a total demonstration and then like I said, I'd like to hire a live model for three hours where we draw in a sequence from long to short, from short to long for three hours. Uh, the problem is the model, and I mean, I, we have to give donations to the model. She has to make at least 60 bucks to make this work. Hopefully there'll be more people uh, joining this uh, as we go along. We got what, seven this week? One, two, three, four, five, six. And we only got six. Oh, one person left. Uh, anyway, uh, so next week I'll, I'm going to talk more about the details and actually do some physical demonstrations of the details. I'll do one today, uh, just so you get an idea how this works. I have a question. Sure. Um, when it, when we get to doing the drawing um, sessions, is it going to be instruction based, or will it be like um, like a lot of uh, studios where people come and they draw and they they use whatever method that they wish to use? No, no, no. I'm gonna. I'll be running. I'll be running the drawing session. Okay. The drawing session won't be instruction based initially. Basically, you'll draw from the model. The poses will go from four minutes through 10 minutes through 45 minutes, okay? We'll do three hours. And then what I will do is that uh, I'll, if the model approves, I'll put the, the whole session online so you can go back and work on your drawings from the model online. Uh, but mm -hmm. what I'll do is the following week, I will critique anyone's work in addition to my own that you want. So I will give you instruction uh, hopefully we could do this as a group. If not, I'll basically give you one-on-one. -on -one. The reason I ask, if it's, if it's, I mean, like I go to the dog gallery in Pomona and, and uh, there's a model there for three hours and, you know, the poses go from you know, one minute to 20 minute poses and, um, and it, and, and that's why I'm asking, it may be possible to, get a lot more people that would be interested in the drawing session. I'm wondering how, if it's going to be uh, just three hours where you come on and you draw the model or what, whether it will be, like I said, instruction based because a lot of people have drawn for a while and are looking for a, a venue to, uh, to continue since this COVID thing and um, nobody's going to the studio drawing anymore. I can run it any way you want. I mean, I can run an instruction based, uh, or I can run it where, like I said, the model poses for three hours, uh, so you get a bunch of drawings in, and then we basically discuss the drawings the following week in terms of what you did. 
Um, I think basically doing it where you draw from three hours and then we discuss the drawings the following week uh, would be the best way to do it. Uh, but I could do it instruction based if it all depends on what this group wants and you know what I could you know get other people to you know agree to with if they want to join. Again, I'll put out an email for the next session and float it out how they want me to run the uh, the uh, model, the, the posing of the model. I mean, it's instruction, but I'm gonna give you instruction based over the next couple of weeks. I mean, I'm gonna do two complete drawings for you, but they're gonna be based on other drawings that I've done. I'll be looking at a drawing of a model, but I'll use, it'll be instruction based for 45 minutes for the long drawings you're gonna be doing. And I'll also do the, I'll go through the quick drawings, the long drawings, That'll be all instruction based, so you'll know what to expect when the model poses. And then, you know, you just do it and then we critique it afterwards. And hopefully, everybody will critique it as a group so everybody learns at once. Um, that's what I'm hoping for. I mean, if people don't want to do that, I'll have to, I'll, I'm willing to do with each person individually, but it'll be a lot of work for me and you, and everybody won't learn at the same time. So, but like I'm I said, it's, go ahead. I'm, I'm curious because I, I know there's a, so much difference but from drawing from a photograph versus drawing from a live model um, using this media, uh, a, a drawing from a, a computer screen or a, a, your large screen TV um, and, and that essentially being two dimensional, how this will compare to having a live model in the room. It'll be interesting. I've never, I've never tried drawing from, a, from a, the screen before. Well, the first model I got lined up has already been doing this. And she's already gone through a Zoom sessions for a group, a drawing group in Santa Fe, New Mexico, that was, it's closed down, was closed down several months ago because of the COVID. Um, I don't know what the detail is because, again, there's no instruction involved there. And I don't know if anyone looks at any of the work. I'm assuming it's going to be different and it's not going to be as effective as drawing from a live model in a room, but you know, there's not much else we can do about it right now. I mean, I've, I've done really this shut down right now. Uh, Danelli, I've, I've actually done this. Um, there's a model that um, does zoom poses on uh, Wednesdays and Saturdays. And uh, she also does the uh, live modeling at the um, um, Booth Museum. For their uh, their art guild, it's so actually pretty close. That? It's it's surprisingly close because um, um, you know it's not quite the same as actually having the model there live. But one of the things I've found is that you, in order to avoid distortion, uh, you almost want to close one eye, like Danelli said, and um, you know, try to eliminate moving your head back and forth. You want your head to be in the same position, whether it's live or on the computer screen. So it's it's really surprisingly close to a, to a live event. Okay, that's great, because I've never done it. So we're all learning this together. This is, I mean, I just started using Zoom, so I'm not even an, uh, a, an expert at Zoom yet, so. Okay, so that's good to know, uh, because like I said, I'll run it any way you want. Uh, the, I still think the best way to run it over the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna give you more and more detail, go over the same thing I went over today again, over and over again, and I'll actually be doing drawings for you. Finally, I'll do a, a full, full 30, 40 minute. I'll go through each sequence, the four minutes, the 10 minutes, the 45 minutes, do a complete drawing, show you everything I do, all the tricks. Uh, and then you can go to the videos. All the videos will be online. I'm posting them all online on my uh, YouTube site. And for those of you on Udemy, uh, the, the videos on my YouTube site are better than the ones on Udemy, particularly for the, uh, the free ones. So I don't know what the hell Udemy did with those videos. Of course, it was an old video camera, which was M M MOD rather than MOV. So that might have something to do with the way they, they basically uh, uh, prop the images. I mean, usually there's stuff that's, you know, off the image on you dummy that shouldn't be off the image that it's, it's there on YouTube. So it has to do with the way that you dummy crops things, particularly on older videos. So I, I don't know what the deal is there, but the, the videos on my YouTube site, all the free ones are there and you can look at those and they're probably better. They're clearer. They're, uh, the framing is much better. The video quality is better. The audio is better. So anyway, 
And this, of course, is all, this whole session will be posted on Udemy, so you can go over everything I said again and again. Uh, okay, I've already gone through an hour and 15 minutes, so I don't think I'm going to do any more demos today. I let you, I don't want to give you too much, so I'll let this all sink in. Um, any other questions? Why don't we do some more questions before I, I sign off on this? I, I have uh, one, one last comment, or it's not really a question, but it seems like there may be a range of uh, experience involved. Um, I don't have that much experience at this type of drawing, so I would kind of lean towards a little more in instructional, at least some up front, so that I'm not spending three hours doing something useless. Uh, well, you're going to get that. Uh, the next two or three weeks are going to be more uh, total instruction from me, and then okay. before you even go to a model, I'm a live model. So I'm not going to let, let you waste your donation on a live model without knowing exactly what the procedure is and what I do and what you should be doing and what the poses are. I mean, I'm actually going to do demos through the four, the posing sequence that I always use, which is first four minutes, then 10 minutes, then the 45 minutes. And I get, again, during the model breaks, the model gets five minute breaks or a little bit more. And I can actually, you know, give uh, information or, or instruction during the breaks and the model gets probably five, six breaks. And that's all open to questions and instruction during the breaks. Are you going to, uh, to look in at uh, our work to see what we've done? Yeah, that, that's key. I mean, that's what I want to do. The way I've taught in the past is typically during each, if we, if you were in my studio, what we do is we start with the model, she would throw five four minute poses for 20 minutes. Then she'd get a break for five minutes or a little bit more. And I'd go around and I'd look at all the drawings and I'd start critiquing the drawings, going around critiquing the drawings. Or I would go, maybe we do the four minute and then the 10 minute poses and I'd make, give the model like a 10 or 15 minute break and go around and critique the four minute and the 10 minute poses. And then we'd go in the 45s and then I would either, again, after each 45, or after both 45s, I'd go around and critique each person's drawings for the 45s. I mean, that's what I do in a live setting. If I was running a live workshop or drawing group, that's what I would do. Okay, but that's not what we have here. So I, I'm going to have to improvise and try and give you something similar to that. That's what okay. I'm going to try and do. Sounds good. Question here. Do you anticipate that we might have access to a different uh to a variety of models different genders different body types so forth uh, here's the deal right now i've got three models lined up uh they're all female it's almost impossible to get a male model to do this in santa fe right now there's only probably six or seven male models i've got 30 or 40 female models and i put out twice or maybe three times trying to get people to sign up to do the zoom thing I could only get three models, uh, two from Santa Fe, one from Albuquerque. They're all professional, they're all female. Right? So there's nothing, I, I couldn't get a male. Uh, male models have always been really hard to come by. Uh, you know, they're like a gold mine in Santa Fe. Every male model that I use, basically usually book two or three, and when we were doing live stuff, they're usually booked two, three months ahead of time. So you gotta book them really early because the good ones are really popular and they're, they're booked all the time because there's no male models. I mean, it's and uh, in the past, we used to have some older models, both male and female, they all, they all disappeared. Um, so it really depends on, you know, what models are available and, and still doing this. So that, that's, that's, those are all my constraints. Yeah. Uh, when I do demonstrations, I will do demos of both males and females, but they'll be from my own drawings from, you know, uh, 20 years in Santa Fe, drawing models off of 20 years in Santa Fe. Uh, so there's not much I can do about the models um, I would love to do all types of models, but again, I, I'm really limited in terms of what I can do right now. And again, I'm not sure. The one model, the first model I'm using, she's used Zoom. She's using Zoom. Uh, Mike Strickland's model, again, I'll probably use. She's done these Zoom groups, okay? So the other problem is they, they a lot of them aren't doing it because they don't want to learn Zoom or they don't have no, any idea how to do it because they have to set up, I'll help them set up the lighting you know, the poses are, are what they normally throw, but I have to set how you know, go through the lighting with them and make sure that everything, all the cameras, uh, how they're 
uh, how they're basically fo uh, taking the videos correct and all that. So a lot of them just don't want to do it. You know, they just, they just sort of, they've, a lot of these models work two or three other jobs and, you know, to make ends meet. And, uh, modeling is sort of gravy on the, on the, you know, gravy for them in terms of it's, you know, it's off the books. It's usually cash. So, you know, that's, but that, that's sort of the, the, the box that I'm in right now. I have a question. Sure. Do the models have to be professional? No. I mean, if um, you said there's a shortage of male models. Um, you got a male model for me that will do Zoom? I'll well, take I'm, I'm not saying I, I'm, he's not professional. I'm just saying if you get a volunteer, That's fine. does it have to be a professional? No, absolutely not. No, I mean, I'd have to work with him to get the lighting right and get the, the framing right. But other than that, I mean, yeah, you know, it's not it's not really hard to be, uh, for this sort of uh, uh, group, you, you don't have to be, it's not rigorous. You don't have to pose like, you know, rock solid for three hours. A lot of the stuff is action poses, four, four minute, you know, they're throwing action poses, standing, whatever. The 10 minute poses are, you know, sort of action. And then the 45s are usually seated or reclining. I mean, you know, anyone can. And anyone can do action pose. You can do a baseball stand, a hockey stand, whatever. I mean, it's a lot of the models I've used in the past started out and they, they, they were just looking for more income. And they were, you know, usually a lot of young people come to Santa Fe, New Mexico. They want to be artists. And they don't realize there's a gazillion artists in Santa Fe that all want to be artists and, you know, make money at it. Probably none of us can. But anyway, a lot of those young models that come here out of art school, basically they get other jobs and then they model on the side to make more money. And they usually don't know how to model. The ones that are from art school, you know, they have some idea what poses to throw. A lot of models that I've used in the past basically just wanted to make more money. Um, you know, it would so be it's... interesting. Um, I saw that when you were showing um, your examples of uh, Riley's technique on portraiture, um, we could find interesting people that have interesting faces and do do portraiture where you wouldn't have to be doing the nude necessarily. That's fine. Again, it's a group. This is a group. This is a group effort. You tell me what you, once we get through with the demos over the next couple of weeks and we start lining up models, you tell me what you want to do. I'm open to anything. It, so It also would probably be easier to get uh, models that are willing to do it draped rather than uh, the nude models. Um, yeah. I think that's, I think that's the problem with doing it online. The, the, a friend of mine who does this, uh, she will not do nude online. Um, and, you know, I, again, I think we all need to really be able to draw draped figures probably more. I, you know, I don't know very many people that, uh, um, that spend a lot of time with in the nude. So I, I think That's most of the drawings that I'm going to be doing are going to be draped. That's fine with me. I mean, like I said, I have three models lined up that are professional, they actually do it online nude. So that's not a problem. So I have models that'll do it nude. You know, people that want to do portraiture, uh, you know, get you, again, I could probably get models to do portraiture online. Uh, draped, I could probably get models to do draped online. I think the biggest problem with the models here right now is that they don't, they don't like, they don't know how to use Zoom and they just don't want to do the, they just don't want to put the effort into, you know, set the whole thing up. Uh, but I'll, you know, I will, I will put out an email where I basically uh, say that, you know, we can do draped or portraiture if they're interested and see if I can get more other, more models uh, to pose. And anyone that has models that want to pose, whether they're professionals or not, that's fine with me. I mean, uh, you know, again, I don't know how on Zoom, I'm assuming if it's, if it's, if it's a small group like this and it's all professionals, there won't be any problem with, uh, with basically the Zoom. And, the only thing I'll post on YouTube, they'll have to be only people that actually donate to the session and then they get the video session on YouTube, but it's gonna be private only for the group that basically donated for the live, uh, live video. So it, it's all gonna be secured. I can't stop screenshots. The first model that I'm using, uh, she's actually been posing for this drawing group, um, nude, and they, the first time she posed, they took a screenshot and posted it online. She wasn't too happy about it, but it didn't stop her. So I don't know how to stop that. But again, that group was not like this. That was an open, uh, that was an open group where, you know, anyone could attend. And I'm not sure they had the, 
the uh, Zoom Pro, which essentially will block anyone in from getting in that's not basically on the uh, mailing list. So, uh, the Zoom think, Basic, I think, is a more open. I think uh, you can also, as the host, uh, prevent recording. So right now I'm recording what you're saying, so I can review it later if I want to. But I think as a host, you can block that, which might be good. I, well, I trust you guys. I mean, you know, if you basically, I, if, <laughs> if you want to see nudes, I mean, this is not the place to see it. I mean, you know, you can go online, you can see all the nudes you want. I mean, it, it doesn't make any <laughs> sense. I mean, you know, why would you want to go to a drawing group to see a nude posing? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I mean, you know, how many porns, I mean, just Google porn. I mean, how many porn sites are there? A billion? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make sense. I mean, why would anyone want to waste their time basically going through a, an entire drawing session to get some screenshots of a nude? I, it doesn't make sense. Um, uh, you know, not with artists. <laughs> One other comment. Um, I don't remember the name of the group, but it was a group in Santa Fe. Um, it was an open drawing group. Um, I went to it like maybe last year. Uh, people just came in, they brought their sketch pads, there was no instruction or anything like that. But you, you know, you paid five or ten dollars and there was a model there. And the one thing that I found really helpful was that there were not only male and female models, but, and I was surprised by this because I don't know that I would pose in the mood, but there were older women, there were large women, there were large men, there were they were completely different body types. It wasn't the, you know, what you think of as a model, someone who's size four and, you know, 25 years old. And I found that really interesting. Well, I can tell you what drawing group it was, and I used the same models, except that none of them are basically posing for Zoom. It was on Louisa Street. It was Argos Gallery. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. I use, ex we use exactly the same models. I have all those models. And again, I mean, if you go to my, uh, if you go to my website, uh, well, I have two websites, but if you go to the newest one I have, which is my name, Donnelly D. Marie, all word, word, dot com, uh, you go to the drawing, you'll see all, all, if you go through all the drawings that are in there, you'll see every body type, every age group, you know, everything you've ever imagined. And those were all models from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Now, a lot of them have vanished. I mean, there used to be an older model, uh, a woman who was in her 70s, who was a great model named Miriam. Um, and she's actually in, in my draw in the drawing manual. There's uh, two drawings of her in that drawing manual. Uh, but you know, she passed away about five or six years ago, I think. Uh, but that drawing group is the same models that I was using up until last year, until this all this nonsense with the, uh, the pandemic started. Those are the same models. I mean, we, we, we this exact same. Everyone uses the same models in Santa Fe because it's a limited model model base. It's not like New York City where you got thousands of models. We all use a lot of those models. I actually referred over to Argos because they, a lot of them came to me first. The way this works is that sometimes I trade models with, uh, with uh, Tony Ryder's drawing out uh, LTA. So I get models from him. I give him models, and then a lot of the models I refer over to Louisa Street. Although the guy that runs the drawing group on Louisa, Louisa Street hates my guts, so I really don't talk to him. So <laughs> there's a problem there. He threw me out of that group in 2012. Uh, for some uh, reason, because I was trying to get him to come up uh, to lower his cost. Would, he was trying to charge me 30 bucks a session to run something that the guy that was running it was retiring, and I was doing him a favor by taking it over. And I tried to get him down to 25 so that I could cover the costs uh, from the number of people that were there, and he wouldn't do it. So I just, I vanished. And uh, he was not happy that I tried to basically lower the amount by five bucks. So just so we could keep it running because the guy that was running uh, left. And so he got someone else to run it a year later. I don't know what happened, but it, apparently it's fairly successful because they posted it online. They got a lot of people to go to it, but it was always, always really cramped, crowded and hot and small. So and the lighting was always terrible, so. but I don't like saying bad things about people that don't like me. So, you know, anyway. Okay. So any other questions before we, I figure out how to sign off here by pushing the magic red button? Yes, no. Well, um, concerning uh, paying for the models, would we do an e-transfer to you? No, 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 no. The way, I, 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 the way I'm going to do it is the model gets everything. 
I'll set it up so the model will basically will be e-transferred to the model through her, uh, her uh, email address. I'm not taking any money because I know we're going to basically probably just, if I can get 60 bucks to her, I'll be happy because that means we can run it because that's typically what the going rate is in Santa Fe. It's $20 an hour. That's the base. That's the bottom going rate. <clears throat> There's some models that charge, um, you know, 25, 30 bucks an hour. There's some drawing groups. Uh, I used to charge 10 bucks an hour. Uh, I used to, sorry, I used to charge $10 for three hours for the drawing groups that I ran. But there's some drawing groups, there's one running in Santa Fe right now that if you just drop in, she wants $25. Uh, I don't know how she's running it, but you know, with the, they're not supposed to be running any groups right now, but I, you know, she's up in the mountain someplace. And again, she wants, if you, if you pay up front, she wants a hundred bucks for, uh, so 20 bucks a session. Uh, 20 bucks a session, five sessions. So you had to, you'd have to pay her a hundred bucks up front if you want to get it at 20 bucks. If you just drop in, she'll she'll do it for 25. I don't know how many people she gets, but you know that's so 10 bucks uh, a session uh, for three hours is really not that's per sort of the bottom the bottom rate. And like I said, just to get this going, model gets everything. I just want to get you know make sure that we can get models that they get paid enough to do this. So. Okay. Very good. Very good. Any other questions? Oh, I got to run. Okay. Okay. I'm going to end this now. If you got any questions, I'm going to post this whole session on my YouTube site. You can contact me by email about anything. I'm going to try and run it next week, same time frame, and then I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to go gradually build it up week week after week before we actually run do it from a live model. And so you guys got to tell me what you want when we run it from a live model. So. Okay. okay. Good night. Bye. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye now. Bye bye.